Welcome to Allergic Living's Allergy Clinic, a new video series in which we talk to leading allergists about topics of vital importance to those managing food allergies and asthma. I'm Gwen Smith, Allergic Living's editor and content chief, and your host for this video series. For our first episode, we have a panel of three top allergists and a very hot topic, the COVID-19 vaccine and reaction risks. We'd all love to get the coronavirus under control and behind us, but there are reports of some severe reactions to the COVID-19 Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Now the CDC assures us these reactions are rare, but the allergy community understandably would like to know more. It's my pleasure to have three leading allergists join us for this discussion. Dr. Kimberly Blumenthal is the Quality and Safety Officer for Allergy at Massachusetts General and Hospital in Boston. Dr. James Baker is the Director of the Mary H. Weiser Food Allergy Center at the University of Michigan. And Dr. Brian Vickery is the founder of the Food Allergy Center at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. So I mentioned uh, in my introduction to people that there are a lot of concerns in the allergy community uh, about the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. And, you know, what is the safety level for anaphylaxis? People are hearing reports of anaphylaxis. So they get a little confused. They hear a lot of headlines. So I hope that uh, you three will uh, help us uh, to understand what really is the perspective here? What's the risk? So we, the best data we have so far since the emergency use authorization of the two new COVID-19 vaccines, which are from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna, are from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So the CDC performs case reviews of all of the reported cases that they get from uh, two different sources. One is your own reporting as a patient through an app called VSafe or a website, but also through clinical reporting through something we call VAERS. And with all of those reports, the CDC follows up any potential cases of allergic reactions, whether or not they're anaphylactic reactions or just allergic reactions. And they've now issued two different reports, one for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, where they estimated that 11.5 uh, or 11 in 1 million doses uh, are potential anaphylactic cases. And then they did a similar report with the Moderna vaccine, which just was released last Friday, and they estimated two and a half in a million doses could cause anaphylaxis, which both of those numbers are in, you know, really imprecise because they're reliant on all of our communities voluntarily reporting these numbers. But I would say that both of those numbers are very small. Okay, there are a lot of numbers though uh, being thrown around uh, in terms of the, you know, the CDC because they did Moderna one week uh, and then previously they did Pfizer. So uh, we asked them as of January 19th, how many actual cases would they qualify as severe anaphylaxis? And they said 45 for Pfizer and it was, uh, I think it was 15 cases for uh, Moderna. So to a lot of people on the face of that though, uh, uh, Dr. Blumenthal and Dr. Baker, that sounds, uh, you know, like that's, that sounds worrisome to them because they hear the word anaphylaxis and they get concerned. Can you give us again, just a little bit more perspective on that? Well, let me, let me first put in perspective. Those rates are now dropping to the rates that we see with almost any injected vaccine. So I think, I think at first we were concerned that this was something unusual or more common that's falling down to a point where we'd expect it to be. Those rates are also much lower than you see with many other things. They're about 500 to 1,000 times lower than you see with penicillin, to give you some idea. So when you talk about relative risk here, I think the relative risk is not unusual. Uh, and the good news is that no one who's had these systemic reactions has had any long-term disability, and certainly no one has been killed from these. So I mean, 
the reactions uh, that we're seeing are infrequent. Obviously, we aren't dismissing them because they are significant, but they're easily treated and the patients have done well. Dr. Vickery, what do you think here, just standing back for a moment, uh, you know, what would you tell a patient with a history of anaphylaxis who might want the vaccine, you know, but does still have that concern? Is, is part of this what we're seeing through media headlines and through social media? Is that part of the issue? Um, this is un unprecedented time for all of us. Uh, and, you know, here we have two new vaccines that are both um, you know, approved through this EUA process um, and are being rapidly deployed using a new technology. And so people are paying attention to new data as they come out. And that's appropriate, uh, but it is important to place those data into context. Um, I think it's important to note here that, that both the FDA and the CDC have said that anybody with a history of anaphylaxis can receive the vaccines with a 30 minute uh, observation period afterwards. Um, and that's consistent with the guidance that allergists are given. Only in the case where somebody has had a specific case of severe anaphylaxis to one of the ingredients in this particular vaccine, um, it, is it, that, that's a clinical scenario, which first of all, is not gonna be common at all. And Kim probably can speak to that a little bit more. Um, and there, you know, seeing an allergist first, having an evaluation and kind of determining whether or not, you know, the, the risk uh, is, is suitable to go forward. Um, is is uh, going to be a rare circumstance, and those patients, you know, should see their allergist. But for everybody else, anaphylaxis to to another medication, another vaccine, a food, an insect sting, anything else, the recommendation is take the vaccine, have a 30 minute observation period in a facility that knows how to manage anaphylaxis, and this can be done safely. Okay, let's let's just jump in and uh, let me reiterate that and, and that the CDC says the vaccines are safe for those with a history of food, pet, insect, venom, environmental allergies, latex allergies. In fact, on latex, uh, they directly even say that the stoppers are not non-latex because people have written up to us worrying about that. But we are getting still a lot of questions about um, from the food allergy community on uh, food proteins. Dr. Baker, can you talk to that again, just a little more fully? Um, any egg, dairy, gelatin, anything we need to worry about related to that with the mRNA vaccines? So first off, these are the best defined vaccines that we've ever made in history. Mm -hmm. They are totally synthetic materials. Uh, and unlike you know, other vaccines like influenza vaccines, there's no biological component in there. They aren't made in eggs or anything else. It's synthesized RNA and synthesized lipid components that stabilize them. So I can, I can categorically say there's no protein in there and certainly no food protein or known allergen in there. The one concern has been with PEG, which is polyethylene glycol, which is a synthetic lipid. Uh, there have been very rare reports of people having allergy to PEG. We've been looking at that in patients who had reactions and not really found it to be a primary issue. So I think people can feel comfortable that the likelihood that they have cross-reactivity to some component of the vaccine if they've been allergic to food or other things is very, very low. Okay, that's great to hear. And I think people will find that reassuring. Dr. Blumenthal, you're a drug allergy expert. Do you wanna add some more to uh, the discussion of PEG and what is PEG? I study drug allergy and take care of patients with drug allergies, both you know, those that are documented, those that are historical, those that happen right in front of our eyes. And we're usually worried about the active ingredient. In this case, the active ingredient of this vaccine is the mRNA. And so we're not going to be allergic to the active ingredient of this vaccine. And there are very few ingredients in these vaccines. And really that we have to look at what's in that lipid nanoparticle. And there is polyethylene glycol in as just is, um, a possibility that it could be related to some of the IgE or immediate or anaphylactic type reactions that are occurring, but we don't really know that to be true. 
uh, we have looked at uh, our population of patients at um, the Mass General Brigham Health System in the Northeastern United States, and we looked at over 1.2 million of our patients that have medical records, and those that have things that might be severe allergic reactions to polyethylene glycol, or something that you might hear as well, polysorbate, which is, an, these both are inactive ingredients. So it's just a few hundred people in 1.2 million uh, patients. So uh, these allergies are described, they are very rare. Of those hundreds of people, I don't know that we have even confirmed that they are sensitive, that they do have an allergy by a skin test. Um, and certainly, um, in my years of practice, I've only actually I, I've seen and now now two total cases of polyethylene glycol allergy. But we are seeing anaphylaxis. So if it might be to peg, but it might not be, and it doesn't seem to be about food proteins, what are people having anaphylaxis to? What I can tell you right now is from the patients in our healthcare system, our employees, of course, went first. We've now vaccinated about 50,000 employees, and our allergists have been um, categorizing the symptoms that have been reported. And there do seem to be different phenotypes or different sort of groups of symptoms. And some of them seem very classic anaphylaxis, and then some seem different than that. And I'd say like there's more um, numbness or tingling or flushing or metallic taste and things that like we actually see sometimes from injectable medications, but we don't classically say, oh, this is anaphylaxis, this is IgE. So I think that there are uh, different things going on in different patients, and I hope we learn more about that in the coming year. I'd agree with that entirely. This is not a uniform reaction. Uh, and you know, when people hear anaphylaxis, they think of IgE. And you know, that's not the only thing that can give you anaphylactic type symptoms. And so it, you could be activating complement, which causes things that activate the immune system and can make it look like anaphylaxis. They're actually receptors on the mast cells. And some individuals' mast cells may actually release in relationship to the vaccine itself. And I think one of the most important things, even though these are rare reactions, we need to figure out what's happening because this type of technology will be the basis for a lot of vaccines in the future. It's so easy to create vaccines. We could create the influenza vaccines within weeks and get them out to people that this is really going to be important. And if people are having trouble with these vaccines, even if it's very uncommon, we need to know why and maybe be able to identify them beforehand. I'm gonna jump in here and add, I agree completely with both what Kim and Jim have said, uh, but just one extra point for listeners about mRNA technology, because it is different. And I think people have concerns about this from a safety standpoint. These vaccines contain only a small little tiny fragment of the virus. Um, that, that's a little message that codes for the spike protein that the virus uses to gain entry into human cells. So you can't get coronavirus from the vaccine because it's only a tiny little piece of the coronavirus. And the mRNA goes into the, the cell, um, but it does not go into the nucleus. So once it goes into the cell, it's translated into this tiny little protein, which is the signal for the immune system to make an antibody response. Um, so the, the mRNA does not cross into the cell's nucleus. It certainly does not bind to the patient's DNA. It doesn't change the body in any kind of permanent way that alters their genetic makeup, which I think is something that um, others have, have expressed concerns about. From, so from a safety standpoint, that can't happen. It doesn't it doesn't affect your genes at all. It, it's just such a novel, different type of vaccine, isn't it? I mean, it's it's just, well, we, we haven't seen these before, yeah. You're, you're exactly right, Glenn. And, and what Brian pointed out is that unlike other vaccines where we inject a whole virus or even a, a part of the virus or a mix of dead virus into people, this is very specific. So it's making a specific protein and that protein's coming from your cell. So there's nothing foreign that's in here introducing it. So, so in many ways, these vaccines should be remarkably safe. And you know, we're seeing that in these studies, we just need to understand how these rare reactions happen so we can prevent them.
Well, now speaking of that, Dr. Baker, uh, the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Disease uh, is, is launching a study and you're going to be an investigator on that. Can you tell us about what you'll be looking at and when that will start? Well, uh, hopefully it's going to start sometime in February. Uh, what we're going to do is examine uh, people that have histories of severe allergies to see if they have reactions and study the reactions to understand what the mechanism is, whether or not there's truly IgE, which we're beginning to think is pretty rare, or there are other mechanisms that are involved. It may be that some people's mast cells the cells that mediate allergic disease are in a way abnormal and can be activated by these vaccines sort of non-specifically. So we need to really understand is it the vaccine itself? Is it how the vaccine was administered? Did they happen to get it in the vein or some other problem? Or is the person getting the vaccine having basically an abnormal response? So that's what we're trying to differentiate. It's going to be a large study, as you might imagine, 30 sites throughout the US. And I hope that we're going to get some uh, answers that will help to better define these reactions and can reassure people with allergies. We are seeing that with some of the information out of the CDC that, uh, that people who have an allergy history seem to be the ones having more of the reactions. So this study will try to really nail that down. Is that what you're trying to do? Well, obviously there are many more people with allergies than are having reactions to this vaccine. So it's obviously a subgroup that we need to define. Uh, and in fact, it may be people that have been misdiagnosed with allergies when they have a different problem with their mast cells. So we really need to look at this population carefully. We mm. need to see who's reacting but it, it is remarkable that the CDC has shown that the majority of these reactions are in women and the majority of these reactions are in people that have prior allergies. So we really need to figure out what the issue is. Yeah. Um, now, Dr. Blumenthal, it, you have such an interesting job as the, you know, the safety officer for allergy at this you know, giant hospital, uh, Mass General. What are you seeing there? Are you, are you seeing um, anaphylactic reactions? Are you seeing local reactions? What are you seeing? Right, so I can comment on those who've been vaccinated, which are again, our employees largely. Um, we are the largest employer in Massachusetts, so a lot of employees <laughs> um, in the Mass General Brigham Health System. And so uh, we, have, we have had anaphylactic cases and we're trying to score them and uh, do case and follow-up review just like the CDC. We've reported all of our cases to VAERS as well for the CDC report. Um, and But there haven't been a lot. Of course, this is a rare occurrence. We're seeing a lot of people who, well, I can't tell you a lot, but it seems to be anecdotally a lot of our employees who have a history of chronic urticaria or chronic highs for an unclear reason or chronic uh, idiopathic angioedema or urticaria they get the vaccine and then actually it, it kind of makes them have an exacerbation. And I think that that's most like been one of our most frequent causes an allergic reaction that might be misinterpreted as anaphylaxis because there's swelling and hives. But the good news is that they're getting immunity from coronavirus, which is at far greater risk and, you know, carries the risk, uh, high risk for mortality. So, you know, it's, it's, Part of what we do every day as, as physicians and providers is to um, bring people around to the concept of um, you know, risks, trade-offs, alternatives. Um, and so when we talk about the risks of the vaccine, those are real risks and, and people need to, to be aware of what they are. Um, but there's also the risk of choosing not to take the vaccine. And, and you just alluded to that a minute ago in your comment, and that is the risk of, of getting this um, infection. So, uh, there are certain things that we, we know that the, the vaccine appears to be 95% effective, at least in clinical trials. Um, uh, I pulled some data this morning from Hopkins um, that, that uh, you know, closely tracks a lot of COVID-related uh, data. Currently, um, 
the estimated rate of mortality in the US from COVID-19 is 129 per 100,000 in the general population. And that includes you know, both confirmed cases and healthy people. Um, that ranks very poorly uh, among world countries, frankly. Um, and we were talking before about a risk of anaphylaxis with the vaccine being, let's say, you know, 11 per million as a fairly conservative estimate, may actually be better than that. Um, that's one in 100,000 for anaphylaxis. So compare 129 deaths per 100,000 with one case of anaphylaxis per 100,000 among people getting the vaccine in um, monitored safe settings um, that is responsive to treatment. As Jim said, we haven't seen any serious consequences, certainly no deaths from, from anaphylaxis. Um, and, and so, you know, to me, you have to, you have to talk about risk from a standpoint of not just plain statistics, but, but simply, you know, from the standpoint of you can choose to do this, you can choose to do this. There's always going to be some kind of risk. Let's talk about what those risks are, what the trade-offs are to, to, you know, action, inaction, um, listen to people and, and what their concerns are, um, and, and really truly try to hear what those concerns are. Uh, and then provide you know the reassurance about how you're going to help keep them safe. Um, and and you know it's it's I don't think it's enough to say well these are rare events and so you shouldn't worry about them um, because that that turns people off. You have to listen to what their concerns are, speak to the data yes, but then provide reassurance about you know we can guide you through this. Um, you know patients do well in the right environment. Um, th these outcomes are, are, are quite rare and the benefits are tremendous um, to, to getting vaccinated. And so those are the messages I would wanna try to get across. That's great. You know, I know you've been studying uh, the psychosocial impact of food allergies. So even as we talk about this small proportion of serious reactions and the vaccines, do, do you think that even, I, I don't know, it, is discussion helping or, or people just getting more worried? There's so much attention on it. Um, I sometimes wonder if there's a, you know, a, a confirmation of my fears bias when you see things in the, in, the, in the media. I write headlines for a living. I know it's difficult because you can't get into nuance. They're, they're fairly cut and dried. Here's a fact, boom. And some people you know, make them a little more sensational than I do. So, but uh, you know, is is there almost a, 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 there's so much concern, I guess, in this community when it comes down to it, when they hear the word anaphylaxis, and I get it. I live with it myself as a risk. I've I've had uh, you know anaphylactic reactions, one of which was very severe. So you know, I, I just wonder. Are people almost too much out there looking for information that may support a reason not to have the vaccine? I guess that's my question. Well, I mean, look, we're, we're drowning in information. Um, this is the world we live in now. Um, and, you know, the, these, these, these algorithms that we, uh, that we follow voluntarily when we're on uh, social media and so on, uh, or even in, you know, email forwards we might get from, from family members, those are all sort of geared on, um, you know, shock value for, for lack of a better term, right? So things that get your attention and certainly things that are fearful um, are, are one of those things. Um, and so people, you know, it's, it's, it's just part of, of, of what we live in uh, now. Um, but again, as I said before, I don't think it's sufficient just to say, oh, these are, you know, these are rare events. Your fears aren't justified. Don't worry about it um, because that doesn't, that doesn't, help. I mean, we see this when we take care of patients with food allergy to, to reassure them that deaths from food allergy are quite rare, doesn't cause people to just stop worrying about it. Um, it might be rare, but it could happen to me. And so how are you going to keep me safe? Um, how do you know it's not going to happen to me? Right. And so that, that, that goes back to some of the comments I made before around, you know, listening, hearing people out. It could be that they have, um, you know, truly gotten some misinformation. They've they've read or heard something that turns out not to be true, and there's an educational step there. Um, and and sometimes you can correct that misinformation, but sometimes it's just really again, people have different levels of risk tolerance. Um, hearing what their concerns are, providing reassurance, and again, getting back to how can we do this and keep you safe while we're doing that. And I think that's one key thing. You know, for people who have a history of having a severe reaction to a food or or another substance. Maybe they don't want to get it at a Walgreens, 
that's fine. I mean, you know, it could be that they want to get it in a physician's office that's that's adequately prepared. But with those safeguards in place, you know, even if somebody has symptoms, those are manageable symptoms. This is what this is what allergists do every day. I mean, this is what we do all day, every day. A lot of people are reaching out to speak to their allergists. I, I don't think anybody minds. I shouldn't speak for you folks, but I, I, I think it's a, a reasonable thing to ask about. No, I would volunteer us. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go there. Um, I mean, we are getting inquiries about it, but, you know, it occurs to me that, that allergists put, could play a key role in public health here. Um, and, you know, we work in conditions that are very, very common. Um, uh, so we, we sort of already are working at the at the interface of public health, but in this you know great crisis and challenge of our time, you know this issue has cropped up, and you know we can do a lot about it. And certainly the other two uh, panelists are 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 very engaged and you know leading the field. To add to that, you know this is the CDC's recommendation now that if you have a reaction or some type of concern, that you go to an allergist and get it vetted. Uh, and I think, I think part of this too is relative risk and what puts people at risk. And I think you know, the media has not been good in, in identifying what the relative risk of getting the vaccine versus the disease is. Every single case where someone had a reaction seemed to be on the news as if it was the primary thing that evening. And I think it's given people um, unrealistic expectations about their likelihood of having a reaction. And I agree with Brian. Our job is to reassure people. Our job is to make sure if there is a risk, it's minimized either by the situation they get the vaccine in or by testing them beforehand. And I think through that, we've been able to get, I would guess everyone who's come to us at least through the first dose of the vaccine, and most of them now are going through the second. So we serve an important function, and people, you know, people should not hole up and just, you know, re reinvest their fears. They need to talk to their doctor, and they need to get this out and get it resolved for themselves. You know, taking this back to a public health issue. If we don't get the majority of the population, Tony has thrown out the number of 80 to 85 percent vaccinated, we are not going to resolve this pandemic. We're going to have ongoing infections. People who aren't vaccinated are going to serve as a reservoir to develop these variant viruses that potentially could escape immunity. We need to get this done and we need to get the entire population on board for this so that we can all move on. Well said. Um, and I should just say, uh, when you mentioned Tony, that's uh, Dr. Fauci to most of us. <laughs> uh, you, you're familiar with him. Um, but uh, Dr. Blumenthal, let's talk also, I think this is very helpful to have this conversation of the, of the context. But I'm thinking also of people who have uh, known allergies to an injectable drug or had a reaction to a vaccine. Do you have any, uh, can you tell them a little bit about what is the real risk who the CDC says shouldn't have the shot? Now, if you think that you're one of these, um, I, I will describe it as sort of the medical mystery because the inactive ingredient allergies are like our medical mystery cases. It's like uh, maybe an allergist has said, oh, this is idiopathic anaphylaxis or because we don't know what's causing it or you've had anaphylaxis on a bunch of occasions, we don't know what's causing it, but maybe it was, some of them were after you know, a, a joint injection, or it was after uh, a period when you were on like opiate medicine and then took some constipation medicine. And then ultimately you, you put it together and maybe there's an inactive ingredient allergy with polyethylene glycol or polysorbate. Um, and those are the patients that might need to see an allergist before showing up to dose one. And then when we think about vaccine allergies in the past, um, First, it's not just any allergy. It's we really it, the intention was really an anaphylactic type severe allergic reaction to a prior vaccine. Those patients might also want to see an allergist beforehand because some of the prior vaccines have some ingredients in common with the future vaccines. So um, the vaccines that are coming from um, uh, expected to be approved from 
uh, AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson have a shared ingredient polysorbate with um, some of the prior vaccines. And then there's a uh, reported, and I will say case reported, like I've never seen it, cross reactivity between polysorbates potentially and polyethylene glycol. So if you're somebody who's had anaphylaxis to a prior vaccine, you don't know what vaccine, you're really worried about it, those are the patients we would be happily see um, to be able to get to the bottom of that before their first injection. Um, and then the patients who have known anaphylaxis to polyethylene glycol or an immediate allergic reaction to PEG, um, those are also the patients we should see before. But everyone else can go and get observed for 30 minutes. Uh, we had, we've had so many questions from our followers that I just wanted to tear through a few of them quickly. These are, are from readers. So um, uh, they are, uh, we're getting a lot of questions about precautions to take. Now, Dr. Vickery has already mentioned the possibility of either, you know, going to your allergist or making sure you're uh, in a, you know, a setting that you known to have resuscitation equipment, but what precautions other than the CDC's uh, guideline for those with a history of anaphylaxis to uh, wait for 30 minutes, what else would you recommend to patients? Uh, anybody can take that one. Well, so I'll go because I made the, the earlier comment that you referenced and, 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 and there I, I didn't mean to denigrate any particular retail pharmacy, um, you know, <laughs> uh, all, all I suggested was, you know, a, a suitable medical environment. Um, and, and I really think that's as simple a message as it needs to be. That in 30 minutes, like Kim said, um, and, you know, and, and echoing Jim's comment earlier, we're not going to get out of this until we get at least 70% of the population vaccinated. So it, we don't need to create, you know, Byzantine protocols. Um, you, you, you heard from Kim, you know, the, the very unique and rare circumstance where people might benefit from an allergy evaluation first. Otherwise, go to a suitable medical facility, um, you know, maybe after speaking to your physician first, hang around for 30 minutes. Um, all of these reactions that do happen, whether they're IgE mediated or not, they happen pretty quickly. So you'll get a sense of, of how well you're feeling. By the way, a lot of people report just uh, when you look through the VAERS data, there's, you know, flushing and a little lightheadedness. Um, that happens when people get injected. You know, you, you sit down, you, you have a little bit of glucose, you wait a few minutes. Um, you know, it, it's, 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 it, we need to be sort of putting people through um, these, these, um, these procedures that we're very well versed in. Um, and, you know, of course, we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about the other problem, which is, which is the supply and the logistics and getting the vaccine into arms. Um, and we'll see how that continues to evolve. But as those sites are set up, um, you know, allergy patients should should go and get vaccinated. Can I add one thing? One of the things that that we are asked most often is, should I pre-treat myself with medication? And uh, it's like an antihistamine, you mean? An antihistamine. Some people are actually talking about taking steroids, which I certainly don't recommend. Um, I think for the most part, you don't really have to pre-treat yourself. If you know you have a reaction, you can pre-treat at that time. And you might, you know, I think it's a little bit controversial, but I think you might blunt a little bit your symptomatology so it would be harder to evaluate you. So I'm telling most patients, just go in, get the shot, see what happens. If you need to be treated afterwards, that would be easy enough to do. Um, but I think I think as Brian alluded to, you know, just pick a good location where they know how to treat these things and where resuscitation equipment is available and go in. I don't think anything else, you know, once you've been, you know, reviewed if that's necessary, really will help the process and, and actually may confuse it even more. I think the only other thing is that if you're a chronic urticaria patient, take your chronic urticaria medication. If you always take Zyrtec or Allegra or, you right. know, or loratadine for allergic rhinitis, certainly take it that day. So if you're already on an antihistamine, continue that antihistamine. If you're already on asthma medications, continue those asthma medications. And then if you're ready, carry an epinephrine auto injector, carry that epinephrine auto injector with you. I was going to say, uh, when I get in line as somebody with risk for anaphylaxis, I'll, I'll have my two with me. No, no question, but I can't wait. So uh, I, 
you know, very interested in getting it. Um, Dr. Baker, there seems to be uh, a fact sheet out of the, out of the UK from uh, Pfizer that, where there's some reference to a component derived from milk and all of a sudden we're getting weekly people worried about, oh, is there milk in the mRNA vaccine? I know you've covered that no, there, you know, it's not that type of vaccine and it isn't, but can you say why? people shouldn't be worried about something derived from an early stage material? Yeah, there's no milk protein in there and that's what people are allergic to. There are some lipid components that are highly refined and come from different sources, but basically there's nothing in there that cross reacts with milk. And this was done out of extreme caution. It was very early on. The lipids are now using our synthetic. So I, I don't think this is an issue with the actual approved vaccine. It was something in the clinical trial. Uh, but you know, there's no reason to be concerned. If you're allergic to milk, you can take this vaccine without any fear. Excellent. Um, Dr. Blumenthal, uh, related to PEG, um, we had the question, um, uh, what if I had an allergic reaction to Miralax, which is a constipation recipe, <laughs> remedy rather, um, and the person asked, does that mean I can't get the mRNA shot? That's a person who would need to see an allergist before standing in line and specifically for, for a dose one. That, that requires a little bit more history about the nature of the allergic reaction potentially something that could be tested to confirm or figure out more in detail before the first vaccine dose given. Okay, and another one, uh, anyone can jump on this one that we're getting a lot. So if you do happen to be one of those people who has uh, what's seen as a severe reaction, um, will the vaccine still give you a immunity? And what if you only had the first dose and not two doses? So the vaccine, the, this is not totally defined because a single dose was not an endpoint in the clinical trials. If you extrapolate from the reduction in infection from about 14 days after the first shot with either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines, there's somewhere around a 65, 70% reduction in the number of infections. A few infections do occur. So there's probably some benefit to that. In the long run, if there is a component that's specifically identified as an allergen, an allergen for you in these vaccines, there will be other vaccines that might be useful. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, we'll have to see how that works out. But I think, I think for the most part, um, if you've had a very severe reaction, uh, and for whatever reason, whether it's allergic or some other type of immunologic problem, you've been told you can't take the second dose of the vaccine, you will still have some benefit in most cases. And we'll be able to monitor that a little bit by looking at antibodies against the viral protein, the spike protein that's made by the vaccine. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Dr. Blumenthal, you recently co-authored uh, uh, an opinion article in the British Medical Journal, uh, and you spoke about the rise of vaccine hesitancy and expressed concern about the population with allergies in particular. Uh, and uh, you wrote about something that's always near and dear to me as a communicator. Uh, you wrote about the need for improved communication. What are you thinking there? What, what needs to improve? How can we improve? Uh, one of the things we wrote in, in, in that paper, and that is true of the United Kingdom, also true of the United States, um, that uh, ev there are a lot of people with allergies in some, in some form. And uh, a severe allergy is something that is interpreted differently by each individual patient and also the clinical providers. And severe allergy to me, an allergist, means something totally different than what it would probably mean to a patient of mine or a family member of mine. And so we need to communicate who cannot get this vaccine because that's just a small, small portion, you know, of, of portion of a portion in America. Yeah. And we also need to communicate who's not eligible for dose two because if you 
are excited about this vaccine or you know you're you're you have allergy concerns but the dose one doesn't go perfectly as long as you don't have allergic symptoms within those four hours initially you can get in line for dose two and it is our job to help you feel empowered to get in that line again and do it um, and i hope that the allergy community can be helpful with this but we also need primary care doctors and uh, primary care networks across america engaged in this as well as every vaccination clinic to sort of have the same messaging um, and be able to help support all of the patients, like the 10% that have food allergies and the 30% with drug allergies, all of whom probably consider their reaction severe to get their vaccines. Dr. Vickery, uh, any last, we're wrapping up here, any takeaway thoughts you have uh, that you'd like to leave with the allergy community? Well, I think with time, um, you know, we're going to see the development of these vaccines as a, a, like a landmark event in biomedical science. Uh, I mean, really like on par with putting a man on the moon um, kind of thing. Um, this has been referred to as Operation Warp Speed. Um, and in fact, it went, you know, extremely fast. Um, but I, I, I think that that might have the the unfortunate effect of maybe scaring people that it went too fast, that corners were cut uh, or, or something like that. And, and I, would, I would try to reassure people that these trials were done uh, very, very well, very rigorously. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, the, the virus was spreading so quickly that the trials could end quickly um, because you see that the group getting the, the active uh, treatment was protected and the group getting the placebo uh, became sick. Um, and, and if you looked at the, the figures uh, in the paper, uh, you know, the group getting the, the vaccine looked like a railroad track and, and the, the group getting placebo looked like your average hill in San Francisco. I mean, you know, the curves were just like nothing alike. You didn't need to be a statistician to see the, the massive amount of protection you get. So, so to get, you know, inside of a year, two vaccines that are 95% effective that are safe to use um, and that can be deployed in the population to try to bring this pandemic under control is gonna be viewed historically as an unbelievable accomplishment, but it can't stop there. Now we have to vaccinate people. Th those vaccines do us no good in the vial. Um, and so now we're sort of learning um, as, as amazing an accomplishment as the development process was, now we're embarking on this you know, equally amazing uh, attempt to try to vaccinate the population and, and deal with, with uh, people where they are and their concerns and get shots into arms. And so, um, you know, we all have a role in that. I, I hope that this discussion has helped people understand kind of where the risks really are from the allergy perspective um, and is reassuring to people because ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, we've, we've, biomedical science has provided us with a gift um, to get us out of this um, you know, horrible situation that, that, you know, has been so difficult on all of us, but we've now got to put that into play. Um, and, and that requires all of us to do it. Dr. Baker, do you have any last thoughts you'd like to share with people? Sure. Reiterating, Brian, these vaccines are a miracle. I mean, there's no question that given both the time of development and the end result, the efficacy, it's remarkable. Uh, People should not be worried about getting vaccinated, even if they're allergic. If they have concern, contact their allergist. I can tell you the first 20 people we've seen that thought they had allergic reactions to bowel preps and other things were totally fine. And they all got their vaccines without an issue. Uh, you know, don't be afraid. This is the most important public health issue in our lifetimes. We need to see it through. And you know, don't believe that because of anything in your history, you are de facto ruled out from getting this vaccine. If you have a concern, talk to your doctor, you know, get it resolved and get the vaccine. It's in everybody's best interest. Excellent. Dr. Blumenthal, last thoughts? Oh, I agree. They, we're all, I, I, I'm vaccinated, every, every allergist <laughs> manning the pager that for our full healthcare system, hearing about every adverse effect, every potentially allergic reaction, all of us, you know, we're first in line as soon as our phases 
happened and we are all happy and feel very fortunate to have been vaccinated. I don't think it matters what vaccine that you take. If, you're, if you have an allergy, the risk is so low. The first one that is available to you, go get vaccinated. I thank you all very much. And we're going to, uh, uh, we'll include your Twitter handles at the end so that people can uh, find you. All of them are on Twitter. Thank you, all three of you, uh, very much for this important discussion. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks, Gwen. Thank you. This has been Allergic Living's Allergy Clinic. I'm your host, Gwen Smith. My guests today were three allergists, Dr. Kimberly Blumenthal with Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. James Baker, director of the Mary H. Weiser Food Allergy Center at the University of Michigan, and Dr. Brian Vickery, director of the Food Allergy Center of, at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. You can follow these allergists on Twitter. Thanks for joining us and see you soon for another episode of Allergic Living's Allergy Clinic.